Hi, Bushka. This is going to be a complicated story. I'm sure you can tell by the look on my face. I've been listening to Kate Bush to get me in the mood for this. Because I'll tell you, this little girl inside me is retreating to her favorite place. We got to go back to 1988. This is a bad one, but it is a good one. And I've been needing to eat some chocolate and I have coffee with a squirt of lemon to get me through this. Oh my God. You know, when I was pregnant with you, girl, I listened to Kate Bush a lot, especially when I would rock you to sleep. That's how you got your nickname, was that song, Babushka, you know? And I'd hold you in my arms and I would look into your eyes. Within those eyes, I used to think too that I saw a beautiful, wise woman within. I just didn't realize that as you would grow, you would have layers. And situations we go through, well, I made some mistakes. And as I told you before, I suffered from a lot of PTSD. And it took a while for the turtle here within me to come out of her shell. But sometimes I do retreat back. It just depends on whom I'm around and who I can talk to and who I can trust. This story, I've been wanting to tell you about it for quite a while. We can use this word here, but I think it's gonna be okay. You may have wondered over the years why I immediately disconnected from my guardian, Gina, and her husband, Bert. I never really sat down and explained it to you as a child because there were some things I figured you really wouldn't understand. But I'm going to tell you a story to begin with it, I'm going to read from Gibran again because this is a lifelong lesson for adults. And it's also going to explain something about a woman who was one of the sisters of my guardian's husband. We're going to call her Jolene. You know, women, they can make big mistakes. And there are women out there who can become and act just like monsters. Sometimes you don't see their fangs. But if you look at them more clearly, you can see the fangs from within. So we're going to do this. You never met this woman. I think you actually only met my guardian and her husband maybe once or twice. I think the last time you may have seen my guardian, yeah, it was at your grandfather John's funeral. And her and I spoke maybe, I don't know, a paragraph of sentences to each other. And that was that. I talked to her once on the phone, probably before you moved away to the East Coast. And it was brief, and it just kind of confirmed a lot of questions that I had in my head. 
and why I was glad I made the, this decision that I made in 1988. But let's start with the poem here. This is intense. <clears throat> Gibran had a way of nailing it to the head here. Let me get my glasses on real quick. This is on children from the prophet. And a woman who held a babe against her bosom said, speak to us of children. And he said, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They came through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children are living arrows that are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might, and his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness, for even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow that is stable. To me, that's a big deal. We're going to get into this. Okay. I wanted to get to know my guardian's family, the family that she married into. I thought I could be friends with Amy, but it seemed like I was just a tag along to her, and she had her own life. She was a year older than me, and she was just graduating and wanting to move forward, and that was okay. I admired her, and I admired the house that she lived in. <clears throat> her parents, Jolene and Morgan, they seemed like a really nice couple, and they seemed like they had a really nice family. Now, Morgan was married before and had two sons, one of them being Jason. And he was off in the Navy, and I was expecting letters and phone calls. It got to the point where there were no letters, maybe I got two. And the phone calls began to cease, and I didn't know why. But we'll set that aside here. Maybe I'll bring it up at the end of this story. Now, Amy had three sisters. Two of them were older than her. One of them was younger. They all lived in the house. This, the other brother, the stepbrother, that was Morgan's other son, he was down in California, and he was preparing to move up to Oregon to live there, to look for work. There was one older sister of Amy's in particular named Rebecca. Beautiful, wonderful person, hard worker. She worked actually in Salem at an upscale hotel. Very responsible. All those girls lived with their parents, even the ones of age like her. They paid a little bit of rent money and they were expected to follow certain family rules. But oftentimes the rules seemed a little lax compared to what I was used to growing up with, a little bit more on the liberal side. Rebecca had a fiancé. 
wonderful guy named Ben. And he had a job. And this job was kind of the backbone of the town. The main employment in Houston was a huge wood mill. You could set your watch, actually, to the siren that would go on. Kind of like the show Twin Peaks. You would know when their shift would start at, say, 6 a.m. You would hear it go off at noon for lunch. And then you would hear it in the afternoon, around 4 or 5 o'clock as well. Which would remind you, you know, you could tell time by it. Ben worked there. He had been working there for quite some time. Him and Rebecca had been high school sweethearts for about, oh, let's say they were together for about five or six years, okay? They're both in their early 20s. They had met and started dating at the beginning of high school. So they were both 15. They went, all, went to all the dances together. They went to family gatherings together. They were engaged. Now, Ben did not want to live on his own or did not want to live with his folks. There may have been problems there. In fact, I think there were some problems with his folks. So, the mom and the dad were nice enough. Jolene and Morgan had a talk actually with the two of them and invited Ben to live in their home. And he would pay a certain amount of rent money, and he was expected to follow certain rules. He lived in a separate bedroom in a separate area of the house. And it just seemed like everything worked out great. I was amazed to see this. I was amazed to see such, you know, loving parents opening up their doors like that. To me, that seemed kind of foreign, foreign kind of gauche. Is something my relatives, I don't know, they would never, ever allow something like that. And I thought it was healthy. I thought, wow, this is a great thing. And I did admire her. Her and I would have little conversations, or hello, how are you? And oftentimes she would come by at my guardian's house, mainly on friendly terms with Bert. And they would pal around, and he was a happy-go-lucky guy. And, you know, Gina was seen as an old-fashioned Northwest woman. And she worked, and so did he. But he had a hard time keeping down a job. So it was kind of up and down, up and down, up and down. But oftentimes, he would arrange for family gatherings for the weekend to go out fishing or camping or picnics, barbecues, what have you. And he was very close to Rebecca's mother, Jolene. What a wonderful woman. She was larger than life and very, very elegant. Her profession was selling real estate. And there was actually a large billboard for the real estate agency that she worked for with her photo on it next to some others. It was a billboard right when you would leave town to head towards Salem on the freeway. She was very well known in the community and very well known at her church. She'd always have the finest clothes, the finest coats, the finest shoes. And in the beginning, I wanted to look up to her and kind of get close to her. She was always kind toward me. That was fine. But something just didn't seem quite right. I couldn't put my finger on it. 
but I did want to get to know the family a little bit more. At the same time though, I was concentrating into my schooling and my classes. And at the same time, I would have some debates and arguments where I would have to put my foot down about not wanting to be Catholic anymore and how I was happy with my new friends. And at the same time, I was getting to know my youth pastor and his wife and telling them about my upbringing, just little bits and pieces, not all in detail, but what I had gone through with losing my mom and how I felt numb. And they could tell that I was a bit angry, you know, a little bit of, we'll call it depression or a form of being melancholy. They knew that it would take time for me and time to heal. But, you know, I was concentrating on school and listening to music and desperately wanting to have a job. Gina and I would debate. She wasn't happy with me. She wasn't happy, too, at the fact that I started taking the pill. She knew why, but because of Catholic taboos and rules and things, even though most of the Catholic girls that I grew up with and knew by the time they were, oh, let's say 15, 16, and were sexually curious or sexually active, they would go on the pill. I put my foot down and I told her, you know, even though Jason was far away, I wanted to have that. I, I wanted to have that peace of mind. And there was nothing she could really do about it because it wasn't wrong. And I was of an age where I could go to any clinic and get it on my own. And I'd pay for it out of my pocket. I thought it was no big deal, but there you go. So I saw little bits and pieces of hypocrisy because these young women within the family who are my guardian's nieces, except for the young one, she was way too young and a really good kid. They were all sexually active, all of them especially Amy. Amy dated a lot and she slept around and my guardians always held all those girls in high self-esteem. Now the two older ones, they were engaged and that was seen, seen as a normal thing to do. In fact, it seemed like I was surrounded in high school by a lot of girls who were engaged and some of them actually got married as young as 15, 16 years old. They would get permission from the parents and they would condone it and they'd work it out and everything would be okay. And get this, one of the head cheerleaders, she was engaged to one of the main police officers. She was 16 and he happened to be about 35 and people okayed it, and the families agreed upon it, and, you know, it seemed like the normal thing to do. I admired Rebecca. Let's go back on her. And I admired her life with her fiancé. It seemed like a whirlwind romance. They seemed to be inseparable. And it seemed like a convenient situation for them because it enabled them to save up money for their wedding in that living situation. Now you remember from a past video when I talked about, you know, the beauty of the brothers. And I talked about that former English teacher of mine 
Mr. Aaron. Him and I were still communicating. He had sent me a gift. <laughs> Actually, I still have it. It's an autobiography written by Mick Fleetwood about his life and the band of Fleetwood Mac. We shared that together. And he would check up on me on the phone once in a blue moon just to see how I was doing and then just to stay strong and that everything would be fine. But <laughs> I'm surprised that he still kept communicating with me. It says a lot because of what my guardian had tried to do to him, it would have destroyed his whole life. And he had a lot on his plate taking care of his children. And he was also seen, and he was, a very upstanding person within the community of Burnside. And he was in the middle of trying to get a book published. Well, he was finishing up writing it, and he would tell me a little bit about it here and there over the phone, you know, a mystery novel based in Southern Oregon, ironically, about three sisters around the 1900s. Imagine that. But we're going to fast forward a little bit. It's funny how I was seen upon by my guardians and by the other adults who were friends or relatives connected to them as seen as a bad kid. I wasn't running around. I wasn't sleeping around. I was angry. And I just wanted to stay ultra-focused. I'm sure if we would have all sat down together with that former teacher of mine and some others, a lot of things wouldn't have turned out the way they did. They were having meetings. <laughs> behind my back, which I didn't really know about. Later on, <laughs> I discovered from someone else who joined in on my side of the family, an upstanding citizen and a wonderful man who lived in Salem, Oregon. He happened to sit in at some of these meetings. I didn't really know about these things until later on when you were little, but that's another story. But apparently, <laughs> my guardians would arrange meetings with all these adults to sit around and shoot the shit, sit, let's say, about why, you know, Isabella is such a dingbell. What is wrong with her? Why won't she stir a certain way? I don't know. It's funny, though. You know, there's an old saying by Trotsky, and I don't need my glasses to tell you this one. Trotsky once said, Ideas that enter the mind under fire remain there securely, and forever. <laughs> I look back on this and I look back on what Trotsky said and it says it all. This was around the time when I discovered that Jason had gone AWOL in the Navy. I had sent him some money for him to take, you know, for him when he would take leave to, you know, get on a plane for a plane ticket to come and visit and take me to one of the major dances. I believe it was the prom. We had talked about it months previously before the communication stopped. 
and it was all arranged. I got everything ready, the tickets, I made the dress, everything. And then communication just ceased to exist. And I asked why. My guardians didn't really know that much about it. And they didn't really want to talk about it. Actually, my guardian's husband, he thought it was something comical. At first, his parents were a little bit worried. And then they got really worried, especially Morgan, the dad. He actually did some researching to find out what happened through the Navy. <laughs> Jason had gone AWOL and nobody could find him. He was nowhere to be found. Didn't know why. No phone calls, no nothing. But then Morgan finally did get a call from him and he had taken off with a woman and was in Florida and I thought okay that's it <laughs> just my luck and I remember talking to Morgan on the phone about the situation soon after when I was done talking on the phone it was in the evening. I think it must have been a Friday or a Saturday night. Rebecca came barging into my guardian's house and she was bawling her head off. She went off into my guardian's bedroom as Jolene was consoling her. And Bert was talking about how he already knew All that time, her fiancé was living in that house, you know, under the supervision. Well, they're adults, but still, young adults having some supervision over Jolene and Morgan. <sighs> Morgan had a hard time sometimes with Rebecca's fiance. They ended up in an argument which turned into a fight. It could have become physical, but I talked about this later with Morgan and he kept calm and stood his ground. It was about following rules. Ben thought, you know, <laughs> that he could do some things on his own that affected the family in negative ways, you know, responsibility stuff, you know, communication, this and that, just little things. But it pissed off Morgan. He called Ben on it. Became an argument and an argument and more and more and more. And then Ben blurted out, well, you know, I've been sleeping with your wife. So the whole time, Ben had been staying there during this engagement to this woman's daughter. She had been sleeping with that young man. And then when Rebecca was leaving and I was watching this go down, as they're all saying their goodbyes in the dining room and Rebecca is getting ready to go out in her car and leave. I stood there looking at my guardians. They mentioned it a little bit and they saw the look on my face. When I questioned them about it later on, they didn't want to talk about it. And they knew why. And ironically, they wanted to stay close or try and keep things good with Jolene. And it led to a divorce between Jolene and her husband 
that had to happen. It tore the family apart. Ironically, soon after, <laughs> we're coming to about springtime, to the time of my prom. There's a barbecue at Jolene's house. Morgan is no longer there. He moves out, gets an apartment, is paying child support for the youngest daughter, no problem. But Jolene had already found a new man. <laughs> And they were talking about how he might move in. They tried to sugarcoat it, pretend like nothing had happened. And Rebecca, I don't think I heard anything about her for quite some time. At least not through that part of the family. I think I saw her a few times when she would visit Bert's mother, you know, or would come over and visit my guardians. But it shook her up. You see how this turned out? It's funny. <clears throat> Michael Aaron, you know, will fast forward in the future as I'm an adult. And on the tail of, end of my divorce and communicating with him over the phone and him and I start rekindling an adult relationship very, very slowly at first. But I told him what had happened and he was floored. He's like, wow. He's like, did you tell anybody about it? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I mentioned it to my youth pastor and uh, my youth pastor saw it and saw the hypocrisy and agreed with me. It, it was a turning point where I knew that, <laughs> like I said before, not all is gold that glitters. And my search or my, I don't know, my view that this would be a stable family life for me. It all went down the toilet and it just pushed me more and more and more to want to move out, but it would take some time. Anyways, I just thought you would like that story. I'm glad I came out with it. I think about Rebecca sometimes now and again wondering how she's doing and how she may have healed. That must have been horrible for her. She invested all her youth into this young man. And on the surface, everything seemed just fine. There are just some things that are, I don't know, you think you should forgive, but I don't know. It's kind of like my brothers. And it makes me wonder why people do the things that they do. When you're an adult, you have control over your feelings. You have control over those temptations. And to cross that line, not only do you hurt yourself, but you hurt the people around you. You know, the people that you're supposed to love. And to me, love is beyond a word. It's an action. And of course, I'm not one to talk. I've made mistakes. I've chosen, you know, a few bad relationships. But I made the first step to get out of it. But to go that far, wow. Anyways, I better wrap up this video. I'm meeting up with my friend Ella. It was her birthday on Saturday. She's a Scorpio, just the way your <laughs> grandma Sarah was. Isn't it funny? But her and I have similar backgrounds, 
and whatnot, you know, even though we're different nationalities. She's actually Mexican-American, but we grew up in similar family situations. We kind of look at it as the same kind of war, but fought on different battlefields. So anyways, I'm going to let you go. I hope you're doing well with your training and just keep doing what you're doing. And remember how much I love you so much. And say hello to your husband for me. Send him my love too. And don't forget to ring the bell. Take care. I'll see you later, okay? Bye.